And the trap that time knocked it loose and came off of St. Joe. So IPFW will put the ball in bounds with an opportunity to come down and tie this score. They trail at 9 to 11. Having played just three seconds more than five minutes of play here in the first half. So IPFW trailing 11 to 10, 9. Looking inside to Doug Ranke, back outside to Mike Pittman. Mike up in the air. A lot of movement this time. And we see on the shot, after the shot, probably there was a foul on Todd Grace. So it'll be an out of bounds play for IPFW in front of the St. Joe bench. And Dave, for some viewers who may not have uh, been watching much NCAA basketball, they would have called that foul in the act of shooting. Mike Pittman would have went to the line to shoot three free throws. Because he was certainly out in the three-point line. Nice feed inside, and Doug Ranke with a reverse layup to tie this ball game at 11-11 at 14 minutes and 26 seconds in left in the first half. And a nice steal by Andy Liebert, and then stolen right back by number 15, Damon White. St. Joe moving the ball side to side. And we see that time. Great pass. Mike Kosge attempted to go up, and Clarence Rich was there to see to it that he didn't get the two points from the field. Now we'll see if he can do it from the free throw line. The great pass by Grace to get the ball into Koski. Yes, time. it was. He had gotten in close, but he knew he was too short to be able to get the ball up as the first free throw is good. Great no look pass. And we see number 12 get into the ball game for St. Joe, Trent Smith. Second free throw, no good. Rebounded by, Je by John Hanstreiter, and here we come down the floor quickly. Clarence Rich on the right side, deep. And they're going to call an offensive foul on Doug Ranke, pushing to get position. One thing Doug Ranke needs to work on, Dave, is making his fouls, I mean, getting his money's worth for his fouls. There he gets a go. lot of uh, ticky-tacky fouls. He's been uh, pretty consistent in doing that all year, and if we could get him to make his fouls worthwhile, if I should say. He's a big, strong kid. And he had defense that time on a guy about half his size, but held him down well. Yes, and, and probably twice away. as quick also. He did a great <laughs> job that time. That's what he has to do. Move the feet instead of the hands. IPFW again setting up offensively against the man-for-man -man defense. Andy Lieber, nice move down the middle again, and Andy's making the move down. And we'll see this time if it's again an offensive foul. I think it is. It is, but again the ball, the uh, basket counts. That would be a little tougher one, I think, to call that time. I'm not sure uh, the position was held by the defense, but it was called. And that play, that's a play, Dave, that I, I don't agree with. That's like going both ways. You get the yeah. foul for one team and you give the bucket to the other. It has to be one way. It has to be a foul, no bucket, or a foul plus the bucket. Yeah. We see that time that uh, Lowell Harper tried to go up with the ball. I'm sorry, it was Rodney Gates. Rodney went up. Uh, John Hodgstrander blocked the shot but got him with the body. Johnson will be shooting two free throws. Johnson playing extremely well as of late, Dave, as indicated by uh, his start tonight and his still being in the ball game right now. A couple of games ago, he had a career high, 32 points. Yes, he did. And he and Doug Ranke are playing at the same time here tonight. Uh, is an indication of two sophomores, and we'll see these guys around a couple of more years here at IPFW as Rodney Gates just tied the ball game at 13 and has an opportunity here to put them ahead, but he does not. Ranky rebounds, and here come the Dons. Seven minutes played, and we have a tie ball game at 13 to 13. Both teams are coming down, getting one shot, and having to head back the other way. 
One thing that's very good to see, um, as indicated by the two personal files on the offensive files, but it's good to see Andy Liebert coming in this basketball game and being very offensive minded. He has those skills, as I stated earlier, and he has to continue to do that. He and Dwayne Shears are going to be keys for IPFW in the future. Yeah, and, and IPFW has needed all year to get as much of an offensive threat out there as possible and, and for everybody out there to be a contributor. Exactly. This has been a great season uh, for IPFW considering some of the trials and tribulation that this team has gone through. They've beaten two nationally ranked uh, basketball teams in the NCAA Division II basketball. But one thing that I've noticed that they've lacked pretty much all year is that one go-to person that you can get your 18, 19 points from and count on in the, in the clutch to get yeah. your two points from. And that to create their own shots. We see Sam Long into the ball game uh, for the first time here tonight as he replaced Clarence Rich. St. Joe very aggressive in that man for man defense. They pick him up everywhere, all over the floor. And Andy Liebert again with a drive to the basket, gets the back basket and a foul. And this time the foul is not on him. That's Sandy's third basket on the drive. Great. And what Andy's done, and it's great he's done that. He's found out that he can beat his man off the dribble and get to the basket and, you know, and get the bucket. And a couple of times could have been three three point plays. You're right. Let's see if he can get a three point play here. Gives IPFW its largest lead of the evening now at 16 13, three point lead. After having been down early by as much as seven or eight points. And for the first time, we saw the full court pressure applied by IPFW, but uh, St. Joe was able to beat that pressure. We almost had a an NBA three-pointer attempted, but it was a pass underneath, and on that pass, Lowell Harper was fouled by Sam Long. As you stated, David, we, we just saw the pressure for the first time, and then the Dons dropped back into what it seems to be a matchup zone with the trapping in the corners. corners. Mm -hmm. Mike Koski in, took the inbounds pass and went right up with it to score. Outside jumper by Sam Long. Uh, he was on the line or he'd have had a three-pointer. Sam got his feet set and drained the jumper that time. Sam Long's been very much the mystery man of this Mastodon basketball team. Coming into the season, expected to be one of the mainstays in the starting lineup and one of basically a probable go-to person that we just uh, talked about a little earlier, but it's been much of a mystery this season for Sam Long. Well, some years are like that. Mike Pittman, three out of the corner. And yeah, and Mastodon's on a nice roll at the moment, Charlie. Yeah, they're playing great ball right now. We're nearing the halfway point of the first half. Ten minutes and 50 seconds left to play, and the IPFW Mastodons with a 21-15 lead. As you see underneath, Lowell Harper missed the short shot, but he drew the foul and will go to the free throw line for two. First of all, IPFW, number 41, Sean Gibson. I think one of the reasons, Dave, that uh, the, the Pumas are having so much trouble with the Mastodon's defense right now, I think the traps in the corners, their offense is designed to throw the ball into the corners, and that's just where the Mastodons want them, right there in the corner, where you can use the sideline as even an extra defensive yep. man. And that's where IPFW putting on his greatest pressure is the first free throw by Lowell Harper is missed. He'll step up there for number two. And you can expect with this kind of a defense, you can expect that every now and then you, you're going to get an opportunity like the Pumas just got under the basket. But uh, the Dons have been bothering the Pumas with that trapping defense in the corners. Long cross-court pass from Sam Long to Dwayne Shears, and Dwayne drills a three-pointer. And IPFW has caused the Pumas enough concern here that they're calling a timeout. And that was a beauty of a shot by Dwayne Shears. He took his time, got his feet set, perfect rotation on the basketball, and literally drained that jump shot from three-point land. We'd like to share with you at this time an interview with uh, Coach Andy Piazza of IPFW as Andy is looking at 
tonight's ball game. Coach Andy Piazza. Uh, St. Joe is is better as far as experience. Uh, they have all five starters back from last year's team, plus their sixth man. Uh, their lack of uh, overall success at this point is still a mystery to me. I, I anticipate them uh, being in the top five in the conference this year uh, at, the end, towards, at, at the end of the year. Uh, our goal is to finish in the top division. Uh, we're there. We've been there for the last couple of weeks with all those great wins we've had. We're in fifth place. Uh, another win assures us for sure of uh, uh, top division and that's where we want to stay in. And obviously with all our underclassmen back, that's a, a goal we set uh, and to uh, finish up with two wins at home and that would give us seven of our last eight in a 17-11 season. So it's, uh, uh, which would be the fourth highest win total uh, in single season in the IPFW history. So that's a, a goal we set also. Okay. As we see play resume here in the first half, the ball was kicked out of bounds by the defense. So St. Joe will inbounds again as Todd Grace with the ball over to Damon White. Damon back to Todd Grace. Mark Scheidler with the ball out front. St. Joe patiently looking on the outside up top trying to look for something inside perhaps a move down the lane. The IPFW defense keeping him outside so they take the three point try. And that was taken by uh, Lowell Harper, which would appear to me to be probably not one of their more frequent three point shooters. You're right. I don't think that's well within the range of Mr. Harper. St. Joe staying with that man to man defense and picking up all over the floor. Pretty sticky defense. Tony Martin's in the ballgame for IPHW during that timeout. Nice pass inside by Sean Gibson to John Heinstrider. Great entry pass off the post to post action by Sean Gibson to Hanstrider. Great seal of his man by Hanstrider also. And with nine and a half minutes to go in the first half, IPFW all of a sudden, Charlie, has uh, leaped up to a 26 to 16 lead, 10 point lead. Again, this, uh, this St. Joe offense is catering to the IPFW trap in the corner. And there we see a foul in the corner off of that trap. Dwayne Shears called for the block. And that has to be a, a great coaching move by the Dons, uh, coaches uh, Piazza and Felsky, because I haven't noticed the Don do, Dons doing a lot of this. I've seen it, I mean, not frequently, but I've seen it on occasions, but not frequently. So it must be a very good coaching move uh, watching the films, maybe, yeah. because <laughs> the See, and humans are just falling right into the Don's hands. And identifying that that was a uh, strength that St. Joe wanted to capitalize on as we see Mike Koski hit the first free throw and here comes the second. He hits them both. Substitute coming back into the ball game. Rodney Gates coming in for Mike Koski. But Mike while he was in there I think uh, contributed at least six points maybe uh, seven or eight. I'm not sure. I have him for four. Four. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was close. Last this game is of the unofficial. season. <laughs> this is unofficial. <laughs> Ball knocked out of bounds underneath the IPFW basket. And it was knocked out by IPFW. The officials first of all called that it would be IPFW ball. And it was reversed by a couple of the out officials who felt they had the better view. Nonetheless St. Joe has the ball out in the deep in the front court. Well, we see a consistency here tonight, at least in the officiating. Uh, now we see a charge on a drive at the other end of the floor. That was a great move to the basket by White, but also a great job by Tony Gibson. I mean, excuse me, not Tony Gibson, Tony Martin to be there to take the charge. That was only St. Joe's third team foul of the evening, and we played nearly 12 minutes of basketball. And we see a lot of versatility right now by uh, Tony Martin, who's played the uh, power four position. Now it looks like he'd be the point guard in there. Well, interesting call from way, way, way out on the court. The man that's in charge called a travel before the ball went up. Sean Gibson, Gibson had had a great effort on the rebound.
Ingham White with the ball over to Rodney Grace. Back to Mark Scheidler. We have a couple of interesting matchups right now. Hans Strider and White. Seems White might be a little quick for Hans Strider. And IPFW all of a sudden appears to have gone into a straight man for man defense. Little change up to see if St. Joe can adjust. Also will tend to confuse a basketball team. John Hans Strider tried to uh, draw the charge that time as the ball was tipped out of bounds by Mark Scheidler. And IPFW will bring the ball down the court. Andy Liebert getting ready to come back in the ball game. To replace Dwayne Shears. Andy, a 6 4 sophomore from Floyd's Knob, Indiana. Tony Martin, a strong move to the basket, and he lost the ball on the way. He saw the opening. Maybe his eyes got too big. There you go. He did everything right until he until it got time to go up with the shot. And that ball got slick. And now we're getting we're trying to get a real point guard in there right now. Mike Pittman back in the ball game. Damon White with the ball. Over to Mark Scheidler. Todd Grace. Damon White, those three guys handle it an awful lot out front. As Rodney Gates and Lowell Harper patrol the inside. And we have an air ball that time. Andy Liebert puts up a three pointer and a tremendous running tip that didn't quite go in by John Hansrider. <laughs> and we see a call you don't see a lot of and you see it where a play you don't see a lot of the player hung on the rim while the ball was still uh, alive and above the rim and Harper's trying to say that he was holding on to the rim so he would not get undercut uh-huh there you see a replay and he's just hanging there Clarence will have an opportunity to extend that IPFW lead back to 10 points with two free throws here and then they'll get the ball. Clarence is 75 percenter from the stripe as we see Harper explaining to the coach coach he, he was undercutting me. Clarence misses the first free throw. Didn't quite follow through on that shot. Let's see if he does a little better this time. There he does. And he gets nothing but net. Yes yeah, sometimes Clarence has a tendency to bail out of that uh, free throw a little early and uh, and from what I've seen. There have not been good results when he's done that. When he stays in there, bends those knees, and follows through, yeah. good things happen. So it's a nine point IPFW lead, and perhaps an 11 as we go up. Strong by John Heidenstrider. An excellent feed by Mike Pittman from the outside. And Heidenstrider is making a strong point to go into the rest of this season and into next year being a very pivotal player in the pivot. As we see this, the long outside three point attempt by Rodney Gates falls short. Clarence Witt saved the ball. Andy Liebert goes up with the shot and couldn't quite get it to fall for him. And Clarence Rich with the steal. Feed ahead to Andy Liebert. Outside to Mike Pittman. And it's a three. And, and Dave, I do not know how Andy Liebert got that ball out to Mike Pittman. <laughs> Well, it's one of those things where uh, everything bounced right on that particular play. And Coach Bill Hogan of St. Joe calls a timeout, probably a good timeout, so that the frustration doesn't set in. At this time, we'd like to share with you another interview with Coach Andy Piazza of the IPFW Mastodons as he talks about John Hanstrider and his play of recent ballgames. Hopefully John played really well in October and November and a lot of it was during practice and early in the year but uh, he went through a, a time period where he was just unsure of himself. Uh, he just didn't mentally didn't feel good of him, about himself and he was second guessing a lot of things he was doing on the court instead of reacting to a lot of situations and John is such an emotional type kid 
He's a rah-rah leader. He's always uh, positive and upbeat and uh, a big cheerleader on the bench and out on the court. Sometimes he gets over-involved in his emotions. And if he doesn't start out the game well or if he uh, messes up a little bit on defense early in the game, then he kind of takes himself out of it mentally. And I think he's grown up a lot in the last month. And down at... Uh, down at Indianapolis, he just took over the game. He had he had 20 people from his family there because Seymour's 40 miles down the road. But uh, he says school record: 19 free throw attempts in the game. During the interview with Coach Piazza, you saw the live play, and Mike Pittman was called for a foul. Mark Scheidler will go to the line, and he will shoot the one and one. They are in the bonus. As IPFW has a 14 point lead, 32 to 18, just under six minutes to play. First free throw by Scheidler is good, and he will attempt the second. Second free throw is up and no good. And that seems to have been a history for St. Joe here tonight, hitting about one out of two as they go up to the line. Mike Pittman that time got a little careless with the pass. Mike Mark Scheidler drive inside. Rebound by John Hanstrader and here come the Mastodons. Andy Liebert drive inside. Ball to Sean Gibson with a nice, nice spin move inside and a two-point layup for Sean Gibson. Great move by Sean. He sure took his time on that one. And the fans from the St. Joe side and the coaches bench wanted to travel. Well, Sean may not have the greatest speed in the world, but he does have the great good hands. Mike Koski had a similar spin move on the inside as he scores for St. Joe. And there we saw the defender, Mike Koski, just a half step behind John Hanstrader. John attempted the shot was fouled as the shot was blocked. So John Hanstrader will go to the free throw line for two. I believe this will be our, the first free throws attempted by IPFW tonight. Or have we had one before? We've had a couple. Andy Liebert, uh, the That's one right. on his three-point play, and then Clarence Rich on the uh, technical foul shots. That's right. I haven't really been watching what the Dons have been doing down low, but Hans Strider's cut across the lane open about three or four times now. I think they're just spreading uh, this Puma basketball team out and getting good spacing, and that allows Hans Strider the uh, space to work on the inside and cut across the lane because you have Sean Gibson on the outside giving him great entry feeds. Hans Strider hits the first free throw and attempts the second, and it's no good. So 35-21. Four minutes and 44 seconds left here in the first half of a pretty well played ball game, especially from the IPFW perspective. Defense has been pretty tight. Offense has been moving. Kevin McGuff, number 20, is in the ball game for St. Joe. And we saw Todd Grace make a move to the basket. He was in among the, pl the place where he was not going to get too much to happen, but he did draw a foul. That's right. He was stuck in there in what we call no man's land, and the Dons kind of bailed him out. He was stuck under there. He had double clutched the basketball, and then he got out of it with the foul, which you have to commend him for doing that as we see the replay there. Todd's a six footer. Steps up there. He's from Plainfield, Indiana. Hits the first free throw. And he got two in a row with a nice bounce. He's a 77% shooter, so it's no fluke. He expects to get that bounce, doesn't he? Sean Gibson with a three-pointer. So the Mastodons have hit a few of those three-pointers tonight, and they've kind of spread it around the whole lineup. That's something that, that makes Sean Gibson's game very complete. He has the ability to hit that jumper. As we see the Dons again, but the uh, trap in the corner is hurting the Pumas very bad. Mike that time uh, may not have made the best decision. He had an opportunity to dish off to both sides, and that could have been a layup. Exactly. He had Sean Gibson open on the right, uh, filling that right lane. 
And you have to give the ball up to the big man when they get out there and fill those lanes. Now from the uh, description the ref just gave, I guess he's given a blocking call. Yes, a block foul. You can see that Trent was not set. Go up, Sam. And Doug Ranke with good hustle for the ball. Couldn't knock it loose. And a great, great block by Sean Gibson with no body contact, no foul called. A great block, as you stated, Dave, but what happened was Gates, in trying to stay away from Gibson, actually put the ball in a position where Gibson could get to it without drawing any body contact. IPFW inbounds underneath their own basket. It was a 15-point lead, 38-23, just over three minutes to play here in the first half. An errant pass underneath, which gives St. Joe new life to come down offensively. Mike Koski out to Damon White. Over to number 12, Trent Smith. Mike Koski tries to go inside with it, and Clarence Ritz strips again. his in pocket. <laughs> Clarence again with what Randy Schiffman calls the quickest hands in the GOVC. Sean Gibson again tried a three-pointer and it came up just a little short. Here come the Pumas. Kevin McGuff in the lineup now with the ball for uh, St. Joe. Mike Koski, fadeaway jump shot is good. Now he's up around those eight points we were talking about earlier. Three-pointer by Sam Law. Up two, two, two pointers. He says he was outside the line. I thought he looked at he was in three-point territory. That's the there. second time uh, they've given Sam a two-point shot. He must have had the toenail on the uh, three-point line each time. But it's good to see Sam get in the action here. Tonight. And do and well. The flow of the offense. As we see the drive down the middle that time and they foul. We'll be called against Clarence Rich, his second. Tony Martin replaces Sam Long. Clarence, is those quick hands either were too quick that time or not quick enough in any in any event? <laughs> One way or another. <laughs> yeah, he came out with the foul. Kevin McGuff at the line, shoot two. First one is perfect. He goes to the line for number two. A little string music on both of those, huh, Charlie? Good looking form on both of those shots by Mr. McGuff. Quickly down the floor, Dwayne Shears has the ball. Looks to the baseline, nothing there. Back out to Mike Pittman. Mike Pittman come back to the left side. Cross court to Tony Martin. You see Sean Gibson playing way outside tonight. Uh, much more so than he normally would, or we would expect him anyway. Nice move to, by Dwayne Shear. Great move. Little hesitation, and then boom, he was gone and scored on the drive. Great move, and again, it's great to see Shears, along with Liebert, going to the hole. Again, the defense uh, strips the ball loose, but they turn it right back. And then swipe it again. Tony Martin with good body control that time. Stop, put up the shot, and got it to fall. 44-27, 17-point lead, the biggest one of the night, as we have less than a minute to play here in the first half. Extremely good move by Martin, to the ability to avoid the, um, the offensive foul. Personal foul on IPFW number 24, Tony Martin, his first personal foul. I've heard some basketball people describe that last call as one that should not be made called as a foul. So it has absolutely no uh, advantage to the defense. Offense didn't lose the ball. Nothing happened that was of any consequence. Right, David. Right there, that just definitely bailed the, uh, the Pumas out. They had a trap uh -huh. on Harper in the corner again. I don't know why St. Joe's not made some type of adjustments <laughs> because IPFW has trapped these guys in the corner all night, and it's 
It's to their benefit, yeah. so I wouldn't want them to uh, make any adjustments if I were IPFW. Lowell Harper hits one out of two. Tony Martin with the ball deep in the right corner. Back out now to Dwayne Shears. Over to Mike for another three point attempt. He misses, but Doug Ranke gets the ball and puts it up and in. Awfully good to see IPFW working the offensive boards and getting those second chance uh, scores. Looking very aggressive on defense and on both ends of the glass, Dave. They're getting the second shots, but they're not giving up second shots to the Pumas. St. Joe is uh, really careless with the ball on offense. Almost like frustration is set in. 40. We will have Coach's Corner for you at halftime as we are 16 seconds away from the end of this first half. And IPFW with an 18 point lead, 46 to 28. Mike Pittman will work the ball. I'm sure the Mastodons will try to look for one last shot so that they'll either be 18 or 20 ahead when this half is over. And it looks like it's going to be 18. As it is on a final desperation shot by number 12, Trent Smith misses the mark for the St. Joe Pumas. So, Charlie, we've had a fairly fast and pretty well played first half here. Yes, as we stated in the, in the outset of the basketball game, the Don started off slow. Uh, the Pumas jumped right out on top, but since maybe midway through the uh, first half, the Dons have played extremely well, all facets of the game going very well. The outside shots falling in. John Hanstrider, along with others, playing very well on the inside. And a defensive end, again, that trap, that corner trap off of the, uh, the zone with the trap in the corner has given uh, the St. Joe Pumas all kinds of trouble as we see the score, 46 to 28. And IPFW have been very alert on the defense. Offensively, they've uh, spread the ball around. I think probably uh, everybody that's played has scored, perhaps. If not, it's, it's come awfully close. Yes, and everybody has played well. Again, we invite you here at halftime to stay tuned for Coach's Corner. And we will be back in about 15 minutes for the start of the second half. Every day, 143 elephants are killed for their ivory. Every day. In 25 years, all will be gone. Buy ivory and you kill an elephant. It's that simple. Write the World Wildlife Fund, Washington, D.C. Welcome once again to another edition of Coach's Corner with me, the IPFW men's volleyball coach, Arnie Ball. Welcome and welcome back to the show. Arnie. Thanks, Mark. Uh, since we last uh, had you here, you had a huge match at uh, Ohio State University against uh, the Buckeyes at St. John's Arena, and the Volley Dons moved to 3-0 in the MIVA with that big, big win on the road. Yeah, it was back last Wednesday. We... Uh Traveled over to uh, Buckeye Land. Uh, it's always a nice short travel in, in, in the vans over there, and I uh, got a chance to play in St. John's Arena, which some of the kids have never played in before. And you walk into the massive space, and you go, "Wow, uh, what a place to play!" Uh, and and we came out pretty flat uh, to start with. As a matter of fact, both teams were pretty flat. It was a it was a pretty ugly game. The first game, there were a lot of service errors. I think I think we had like five or six just ourselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they reciprocated and, uh, and, and returned the favor, uh, but uh, eventually they they won the game, uh, 15 to 12, I believe was the score. Uh, our kids held their composure and uh, just kind of hung in there, and we gradually got uh, got our legs back underneath us and uh, were able to uh, do some things that we weren't able to do in the first game, especially offensively. And uh, they, they are a good defensive team. They dig a lot of balls, bring the ball back, and we. In the first game, kind of stand and watch it, and uh, and not be able to transition with it. But as the match went along, in the second uh, and third game in particular, 
uh, we were able to do some things. And then in the third game, we got behind uh, 11 to 7. And uh, Norman wasn't playing very well, so I put Juan in. And he, and he did a nice job of just maintaining where we're at. After having Norman uh, set out for a while, he came down to me and said, Coach, I'm ready to play. And so we let him set out a little bit longer. <laughs> get just a little bit hungrier yet and he came back in and blocked a couple balls and and uh, we served the ball real well in, in that stretch and we came back and beat them 15 to, uh, uh, to 11 mm -hmm. and after they were down ahead 11 to 7 it kind of took the momentum away from them and in, in the fourth game we were able to pretty much control the match from there on out so a huge uh, win on the road you have just uh, one big match left on the road in the conference actually you've played all but two conference matches uh, right now we're four and oh um, this had to be huge, the fact that we took them 3-1 in their building. It, it might have did a lot to demoralize Ohio State. I know we played them in the final home match of the year, and, and that could really uh, get this team pumped now to be the number one seed in the tournament. Well, it certainly is a, a good position to be in. Uh, we, we like being in this position as compared to where Ball State or Ohio State <laughs> are at. Uh, Ohio State and Ball State have to play one another yet uh, at Ball State, and of course we have to go to Ball State on the 27th of Mar March also mm -hmm. uh, to play them, and, and they will be ready. Uh, their, their two kids that have been hurt will probably be back by that time, and they're going to be anxious to uh, redeem uh, a couple losses they have. But our kids are, are playing with a lot of confidence right now and certainly like the position that we're sitting in. All right. uh, after the Ohio State match, then we had a couple of matches here at home. Uh, you hate to say there were warm-ups, but uh, you got to play everybody, and I think the team really had a lot of fun. All 15 guys, I believe, played both nights, Friday and Saturday, against Tri-State and University <laughs> of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Well, we did get a chance to play a lot of kids. Uh, it's like a, um, I was telling uh, the newspaper guy uh, last Friday night, it's like a mirror for me looking into our program about 12 years ago and looking at the Tri-State program and going, yep, I know exactly where they're at exactly where they're coming from because that's what we look like. Uh, Dave is doing, Dave Science, who's the coach up there, mm -hmm. is doing a real nice job. It's the first year for them to be a varsity program and, and of course we're trying to help them just like Ball State and Ohio State's trying to help them uh, build a schedule and, and build some kind of a, a program where they can uh, continue to recruit and get good quality athletes and they were pretty much intimidated. They're, they had a big 6-7 kid who got hurt right away in warm-up and he didn't even get to play. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I knew they'd be intimidated. Their coach knew they'd be intimidated. Uh, I think their kids knew they'd be intimidated. So we split our team into two groups and, and really gave some of our um, second team groups, uh, our kids, a chance to play with some of the first teamers and uh, we did that all the way through that whole match. And so everybody got a chance to play and some of our kids don't get to play uh, too often. They had some real good stats and, and came away with a real confident feeling. Of course, on Saturday night we played uh, uh, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, which is a member of the conference, and, and we played them twice before uh, during the year and, and defeated them both times, and uh, so we pretty much knew what to expect from them. Now, they're a better team than what uh, Tri-State is, mm -hmm. uh, primarily because of high school volleyball in uh, Wisconsin, right. and so most of their kids have at least played competitively in some fashion or another, and they have a couple of kids that are real nice players. Uh, once again, uh, they, they, they didn't play real well uh, against us. Uh, I got a chance to play a lot of kids. We did play the first team, the first game and a half, uh, because we felt we needed to develop some uh, uh, confidence and, and some rhythm within our, with our first group, and then we got a chance to play the rest of the kids, and they did a nice job. Yeah, I know Friday night uh, I was talking to a few people around the, the uh, court, and it reminded me of the early stages of the IPFW program, and I thought I had mentioned to several people that I thought it was really great that you had scheduled them and that you're giving them the chance that, you know, IPFW was looking for when we first started the program back in 81. I know uh, it was tough to get a lot of teams to want to schedule us early in, the, in your career here, and uh, I just thought it was really commendable that you would let a team like Tri-State come in here. They were really sure, like once the 6-7 kid got hurt, I think most of their players were under 5'8 or 5'10, you know, and that really hurt them. But I think Dave Sines is doing a good job, and I think he'll be able to bring a program out of Tri-State. Well, that's one of the goals uh, of, of the Midwest uh, volleyball people is to see our league grow. And Tri-State is talking about coming into the league next year, and if indeed that's true, that would make us five teams, which is uh, two more than we had a year ago. And there are a couple other schools around the Midwest that are talking about the same kind of concept. and so. Anything we can do to help help it grow. There are a lot of young men right now out there looking for places to play, and there just aren't enough opportunities. And so we really need to uh, do do as, as much as we possibly can 
to help some of these other programs grow. I know another thing, uh, Saturday night, uh, there was a brand new volleyball sitting on the table with all the players' names and, you know, the 1990-91 volley dons. What was the story behind, behind that? Well, we had a young uh, a father who had written Fred Malcolm a, a letter uh, in regards to the fact that his son uh, idolized Fred and his son was 11 years old and uh, his son had passed away just recently unexpectedly and one of the things the father had talked to the son about was getting an autographed ball from our team uh, and uh, of course he wasn't able to do that before the, the young man passed away so the father had written Fred and, and uh, we, we got a ball together and presented it to the father on Saturday night and uh, just a little token of our, our appreciation to the father and, and certainly uh, the fact that his son had uh, taken Fred as kind of an idol. Right. Not a bad one to take as an idol, I no, might add. No, certainly true. Um, now coming up over spring break, the spring break's coming up uh, this weekend. Uh, the team looks forward, I'm sure, to going out west and taking on some of uh, the West Coast best. Uh, three teams from California, one from Utah. They open up uh, against BYU, and uh, they've been drawing some pretty big crowds out there. And they're having trouble winning, but they're at least got a lot of fan support at BYU. Well, yeah, they have the largest attendance, average attendance of any NCAA men's volleyball uh, team in the country, and in the past they've driven, uh, drawn up to 7,000 people for Pepperdine and USC and those kind of things. And I don't know what kind of crowd we'll have out there, but, but the kids are looking forward to going out. It's the first time for most of us to ever have been to, to BYU, including myself. I've never been there before. Of course, Coach McGowan does a really outstanding job with the team out there, and even though they're struggling in the Weva, uh, they'll be ready to, to play us because we beat them over at Penn State, and the coach wasn't real happy about that. So that'll be a good, a good contest for us. Uh, then we travel into to L.A. and play USC, and, and, and I'm sure USC will, uh, will be better prepared this time than they were the last time when we played them. They've only lost one game since they lost that one to us back in January. Then the next night we travel down to UC Irvine, which is just down the highway. Uh, from uh, USC uh, to, to play the Anteaters. And I fi find it interesting that it's the Anteaters as compared to the, and playing the Mastodons. So two great uh, uh, schools <laughs> here playing one another. Uh, but uh, they are, they're a relatively young program as well, uh, but they, they fit right in what we're trying to do as far as uh, our spring trip is concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they have a couple of young kids that are very talented, and, and they will be, uh, of course, uh, wanting to prove the fact that the, they're, they're better than a Midwest team and a team that's ranked pretty high in the country. And then on Friday, we go down to San Diego State and play down there. We'll get a chance probably on Thursday to go over and visit the National Training Center or Friday morning, uh, that kind of thing, and then come back home on Saturday. That'll be a nice experience for the kids. The training center is in San Diego, I believe. Yes, that's correct. Um, but this is going to be a great trip. They open up with uh, BYU and then go out to L.A. to take on the number one ranked USC Trojans, who, of course, were here in a very close match. It was 3-1, to one, and we very easily could have sent it into a fifth game with 13 all in the fourth. And then finish up the rest of the trip against UC Irvine, who I believe right now is ranked 18th. But you're right, they're going to want to beat a non-West Coast team mm -hmm. pretty bad. And then finish up against... Uh, San Diego State, who's the fifth ranked team in the country. And of course, the Volley Dons right now are ranked 11th in the latest poll. And I guess the biggest question going out west is who's going to be starting? You've seen all your guys. There are 15 guys have been playing. <laughs> Everybody well, wants to be in there now. You know, a little bit depends on uh, if we stay away from injury and, and illness, that kind of thing. We have a couple kids that have got uh, a little bit of the sickness uh, right now. But we're pretty much uh, committed uh, at this point, anyhow, to Lloyd being our setter and, and Fred and Tom in the middle mm -hmm. with Neil Day certainly pushing uh, both of those individuals. Uh, Neil could start for us and, and will play a lot for us on this West Coast trip uh, with Norman and Tony uh, and uh, Raul on the outsides. Uh, of course, Juan Ortiz is playing real well, and Quentin Spiegel this weekend played real well. And, uh, and that's a real, real nice thing to, to see happen because he needs to, to develop some confidence and get some playing time out on the West Coast. Larry Fulgeri is playing uh, also well. So we have about nine or ten kids that I think are real capable of, of helping us as we go along. The who starts, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> well, the Volley Dons will be on the road for a while as they head out west during spring break. Uh, they won't be back here at the Mastodome until March the 20th when they host Graceland University, but that's a ways down the road. The team's got other 
factors involved as they head out west. Team overall is 9-4 and four right now, 4-0 oh in the all-important MIVA as they look to be the number one seed heading into the MIVA tournament in April. For Coach's Corner, I'm Mark Banger. We'd like to thank Coach Arnie Ball for being here Thanks, once again. Thanks, Mark. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Welcome back to the IPFW Athletic Center as we are about a minute away from tip off for the second half to bring you up to date a little bit on some of the statistics for the first half. The leading scorers for the IPFW Mastodons were Sean Gibson, Dwayne Shears and Andy Liebert all with seven points and Charlie that's awfully good balance for the scoring in the first half but we knew that was uh, or suspected that was the case because it had been pretty well spread around throughout the lineup. And, and what we, we see on there, Dave, yes, we, Sean Gibson, a name that we're used to seeing kind of up there in the high scorer list. But look at Liebert and Shears, and they've uh, changed their basketball games and for the better. They're going to the hole much more, and when you go to the basket like that, that will open up your outside game, as we saw uh, Dwayne Shears take his time and drill a three-point shot with perfect form. For the St. Joe Pumas, we saw that the leading scorers were Mike Koski, who came in off the bench, but he is their leading scorer. And then Rodney Gates also had eight points. Gates, and Harper, Schneider, leading rebounders for St. Joe. John Heidstrider had a great first half on the board, six rebounds. Clarence Rich and Sean Gibson, three each. And we're seeing a lot of good things, Dave. A lot of people starting to play well the latter part of this uh, basketball season, and which will be a great build-up going into uh, the 1991-92 season. We have the second half underway now as IPFW inbounds the ball on the alternate possession. St. Joe would appear that they might be back into uh, their man-for-man -man defense as they started the first half. Nice dish underneath and hesitation and basket by John Hunstrider with a great feed by Sean Gibson. 20 point lead. And John ought to buy Sean a steak dinner after this basketball game. He's consistently fed him on the inside <laughs> for easy buckets. Apparently the ball uh, bounced off of a foot for IPFW somewhere along the line. And so the ball is being reversed back and given to St. Joe with a new shot, 45 second shot clock. The discussion at the table has to be relative to how many seconds to have on the shot clock, although I'm sure I saw the signal for the reset. That's the thing they're questioning. The uh, referee initially called uh, kicking uh, the ball on Sean Gibson, which automatically resets uh, uh -huh. the shot clock. And I think another, uh, the other referee interjected and stated that there was not, in fact, a kick. So we have 38 seconds on the shot clock. I there think we go. the explanation was that. It was an inadvertent whistle, as we hear about now and then on almost every sport. Yes, they called uh, just a tip of the ball with the hand as opposed to a kick, which would not be a reset of the shot clock, and which actually would have just been whoever got the loose ball. And it uh, would appear to have appeared to be IPFW coming out of there, but here we see the ball inbounded underneath. Defensive laps by the Mastodons, and a quick score by Rodney Gates for St. Joe. And we have a foul call on number 21, Rodney Gates, St. Joe. Again, we saw Hans Strider breaking across the lane free, and Gates had to grab him. And just as you had described it in the first half, uh, John had been getting open by breaking across that lane a great deal. The purple-clad St. Joe Pumas. 
Shears with the ball in the deep right corners. Nice feed inside. Sean couldn't quite go up with it quick enough and uh, couldn't get the two points to fall. Again, the quick move down the middle by Todd Grace, number four, and he drew the foul, number four. Grace deceptively quick going to the hole. St. Joe had all kinds of shooting difficulties in that first half, uh, Charlie. Eight out of 22 for 36 percent, some of which you can attribute to the defense. But uh, shooting was just not uh, up to par in that first half as Todd Grace hits the first free throw. And a lot of times they did not even get shots off because of that trapping defense off of the zone that IPFW uh, put on these uh, Pumas. There you go. IPFW shot very well in that first half on 19 for 36, 53 percent. And there we see a three pointer. Mike Pittman. And in three point, for example, in that first half, IPFW was five for 11. And now they're coming out hitting that first one. As we see the easy layup scored by Rodney Gates. John Hanstrider had the ball blocked away that time. Looks like St. Joe might like to pick up the pace a little bit here, Charlie. They're well, they're going to uh, have to if they want to get back in this. And great move by Grace. Todd Grace. They're, uh, they're really going at it down to uh, taking it right to the hoop. And IPFW throws the ball away. Oh, there was a great big travel right in the middle of the floor. <laughs> and here we see a run. As that 20 point lead has been whittled down to 13 and IPFW takes a quick quick timeout here with just two minutes played in the second half and uh, St. Joe is on the run a good timeout by uh, coach Piazza what we have here Dave the uh, the Pumas have to get the up and down game they have to score points so they have to get into this up and down tempo uh, to get back into this basketball game the Dons were up by 20 points at one time so all they need to do is run some clock each time down and get good shots the college cable access program guide provides information about one about our programming including complete monthly sports listings to receive your free channel 6 program guide send your name and address and zip code to college cable access center at IPFW Fort Wayne, Indiana, 46805-1499. Or call us at 481-6582. Well, IPFW will inbound the ball and attempt here to slow down this surge by St. Joe, which uh, I've forgotten exactly the halftime score, but I think it was 48. 46 28 maybe and it's 46 28 and in two minutes St. Joe has come out here and scored 10 points. And IPFW has thrown the ball away for the third time. Mike Pittman stepped in defensively drew the charge. Tonight's a charge night. <laughs> That's the MasterCard call. Very close play though, very close. Mike has had all kinds of physical ailments here in the last part of the season as we see a three pointer by Dwayne Shears. But Mike has had ankle problems, he's had uh, hamstring problems, he's had calf muscle uh, cramps. Again, St. Joe Dave has not adjusted to this trap off of the zone press that IPFW is putting on. And then we just saw Dwayne Shears drain another three pointer when he when he has his feet set and knows he's ready to shoot the ball when he gets it. He's one of the better shooters I've ever seen. Good defensive pressure by the Mastodons this time but John Hanstrader caught trying to deny a pass. Bounds the ball 
Uh, not much defense that time. And off the glass. Mike Koski with that short jump shot. And with the activity on the floor, John Hanstrider trying to get loose underneath was having quite a go around with Rodney Gates. Now they're far enough out on the floor that uh, they can pick up, and now we get back up underneath and we'll see what happens. Dwayne Shears with another three. He's got that itch tonight. Exactly. But again, Dave, you're talking about someone who scored 25 points a contest in junior college and had been kind of struggling up until the last uh, five or six games here uh, at IPFW, but is coming on very strong. So it's not exactly a new experience for him to be able to uh, put the ball through the hoop no, with and great can, regularity. No matter if you can average 25 points at lunchtime, you're doing pretty good. And <laughs> average 25 <laughs> points in college, that's a great feat. Tony Martin with the ball goes deep to the baseline. Andy Liebert. Andy got an awfully tight quarters there and tried to dish off and made a bad pass. Oh my. Now there was some awfully good contact that there should have been either a charge or a block one or the other. We're, we came out lucky on that. That had to be a block on Sean Gibson. I think you're right. Because they made great contact. Nice move by Sean Gibson underneath. Puts it up and in. A great way to use that hook. Just a split second, not long enough to get the offensive foul, but just quick enough to get to gain the advantage on the defender and get to the hoop. Oh, nice move by Dwayne Shears that time as the St. Joe player tried to bounce it off of Dwayne in the corner, and then Dwayne couldn't quite get the pass to come up for him. Again, the steal, Dwayne Shears just got was off that trap. As you see Mike Pittman come in for Tony Martin, and it's interesting, we have not seen Jeff Smithy or Kevin Shank tonight. We've seen Tony Martin inserted in that point guard position for Mike Pittman, who I have said all year long, I actually like better at the two guard slot. Well, the coaches have talked uh, during uh, different times during the course of the year that they really feel confident enough that they can use Tony Martin at any one of the five positions. And there on the slam dunk was two points for Mike Koski, and he drew a foul on Doug Ranke. Doug's second foul. That's one of those fouls, Dave, where Doug Ranke, that's when you got to get your money's worth. Again, you have another foul where he does not get his money's worth. He has to stop Koski from getting that ball up on the glass or just let him go in that's for right. the two points because as you've seen the replay there, he was already almost up to the basket. So you either let him go or make sure he does not get the chance to complete the three-point play. And he does complete the three-point play with the free throw. 59-45 at uh, nearly five minutes played here in the second half. And Mr. Koski has come alive. A lot of bouncing going on inside there with John Hanstrider. Andy Liebert again with the move on inside. And we see a nice move on the inside. We saw a defender with his hand in the net, which could have been. Call, but not. Foul is called on Lowell Harper. IPFW had one of those earlier, Dave, where they had their hand in the net in the first half, and there was no goaltending call. And the uh, Puma bench was going crazy wanting that uh, goaltending call. Well, St. Joe's not making too much noise right now on this one, so it's, it evens out. First free throw is good by John Hanstrider. He will attempt number two. There we see the man in with his hand in the net. There wasn't much contact. <laughs> not a lot. <laughs> Harper had a good... A good gripe there with the referee. Two straight free throws by John Hanstrider pushes the lead back up to 16. Almost where it was at halftime with 18. <laughs> Quickly down the floor. Andy Liebert, John Hanstrider inside, outside, and there we go with the jump shot. Gibson gets the rebound, puts it up and in with great timing on when he's going to go up with it. Exactly. IPFW completely massacring these Pumas on the offensive glass. 
But the press defense is uh, leaving a few holes. <laughs> Mike Koski has uh, been a man possessed here in the second yes, half. 19 points. And that means he scored 10 here in the second half in just uh, about six minutes of play. And two of those have been very fashionable dunks. Yes. Mike Pittman with the ball. IPFW a little more deliberately setting up on the offense. St. Joe still with that sticky, sticky man for man defense. Playing very tight. And they have made a great adjustment. IPFW is not getting those first inside shots, but they have not made the adjustments on the offensive glass. Nice move by, by Doug Ranke that time. Great fake. Drive to the baseline. Reverse layup. Great ball fake by Ranke. Great I like, ball fake. I like I to see it. him thinking that way. And again, the ball fake was so good. <laughs> Ranky's not the quickest guy in the world, and he made the ball fake, and Koski was so frozen by the ball fake, Ranky had plenty of time to go in for the reverse layup. No problem whatsoever. The drive down the lane, and Ranky got a finger on the ball, I think, to get a slight tip. Lowell Harper back into the lineup now for St. Joe. Mike Koski comes out. Damon White with the ball. Out to Todd Grace. Back to Damon. Lowell Harper on the outside. Andy Liebert got a hand on it, and he really hustled, but he uh, he hit the deck. Couldn't quite come up the ball, but great effort. Great effort. And the crowd acknowledges this great effort with a good hand clap there. Referee shakes his head, which is either going to indicate he didn't see it or he didn't think there was contact made. <laughs> Foul called that time on number 21. Rodney Gates. His second foul of the evening. We see the action there in the replay. Doug Ranke battling underneath. So Doug will step to the line. And St. Joe arguing that Doug Ranky was not shooting the basketball. They're saying that it was a free ball they both were going for. If they're not arguing the foul, they're just arguing the fact whether or not it was a shooting foul or not. Well, Doug didn't follow through very well on that shot. Let's see if he uh, relaxes a little bit more and gets the follow through and drops this free throw in. From the looks of it, Doug, I think, needs to get more legs into his shot. Kind of stiff. Yes. All right, St. Joe gets the ball across against the press. IPFW drops back down with the defense a little bit lower. Clarence Rich was alert that time, and so they couldn't backdoor him with the lob. Out of bounds from St. Joe. Mike Pittman brings it down, looking for the offensive set for IPFW. Out to Andy Lieber. Andy inside to Doug Ranke. Doug got in very tight territory and uh, didn't get rid of it fast enough. Oh, a great, great move. And Doug Ranke is going to get the basket to count. But on the charge, he drew a foul. And Lowell Harper's getting up very, very, very slowly. Slow. Again, that's the third call we've had tonight. <laughs> Dave, where they, they go in and get the foul as you see the replay here. I think they need to change a rule or something and get to the point where it's either no bucket, charge, or and we see the, the foul that plus last time. the free throw. And that all was started by a great save by Mike Pittman, as we saw earlier in that replay. I have a hunch that Lowell Harper will not be quite as anxious next time to stand in front of that uh, Offensive move, and this time <laughs> Doug didn't get his money's worth on foul number four. Sixty-eight, fifty-one. IPFW Mastodons in the lead over St. Joe College from Rensselaer, Indiana, here tonight. 
Just under 12 minutes remaining in the second half. As we saw Doug collect two fouls in about all of seven seconds. St. Joe with the ball. Trent Smith, one of the guards. Mark Scheidler, Lowell Harper, and there we see Mark Scheidler again. And the ball knocked loose underneath. It will be out of bounds to St. Joe underneath their own basket. Lowell Harper and Mark Scheidler set up close underneath, and Mark moves to the corner. Out deep to Trent Smith. Back around to Todd Grace. Todd drives the lane, and Todd has been doing that a lot this second half. Yes, he's shown great quickness, and uh, doesn't look to be very quick, but Todd's shown great quickness uh, uh, going to the basket with either hand. First free throw is good. Second one on its way, and it's also good. Two substitutions into the IPFW lineup. Sam Long and Dwayne Shears replaced Lawrence, uh, uh, Clarence Rich, and Andy Lieber. Nearly a quick break underneath. John Heinzreiter lost the ball. This time he gets it and goes back up. Puts it in for two. Three big fellas uh, in this sophomore class that play underneath for IPFW, and this is the last game this year, but I'm sure those three, uh, Charlie, will see a lot of action out of in the next couple of years. Sean and Gibson. Been, and they have, they have been playing well, the guys you were talking about, Sean Gibson, John Hanstrider, and uh, Doug, Doug Ranky. Ranky. Particularly um, Hanstrider and Gibson. Gibson, the mainstay of the three, the most consistent of the three. Hanstrider been playing great as of late, and Ranky playing a lot better. You just have to keep Doug out of the foul trouble. And another player in that sophomore class, Pat Murphy, although he hasn't played tonight, but another big kid that can play strong on the inside when you need him. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a team that only has one senior. So besides Mike, Mike Pittman, who they will miss, they have all their players coming back, and hopefully we can get some good recruits in here and have a great year next year. St. Joe drops the free throw in. BFW moving the ball fast. This time Sam got the three. Sam's been flirting with that three-pointer all night. He has hit a couple of uh, long two-pointers. We're back to that 18-point lead, which is where we started the second half, and we're nearly at the midpoint of the second half. And again, that inside move. Todd Grace has been very aggressive in this second half. And IPFW not very effective in shutting him down, but nice move that time by Mike Pittman. He couldn't get the short jumper to fall in. Good, good ball movement that time. Great pass by Grace off that break. I thought he was going to go up with the alley oop, but he made a great pass. Great pass as you see the replay there. And we see the body contact uh, inadvertent, of course, out of bounds. And Shiler has great athletic ability. He just came down uh, the lane and just jammed that ball in the basket. Yes, he did. So two quick baskets by St. Joe has cut that lead back down. IPFW setting up their offense against the St. Joe man-for-man -man defense. Very tight man for man. And we're going to see an offensive charge call. Looked like Dwayne might have lost his balance that time. Couldn't pull up and stop. St. Joe with the ball. Todd Grace. Todd Grace and Mike uh, Koski have really had a good second half here. Sam again with a three-pointer. 
Sam's got the hot hand here tonight. Again, Dave, as you mentioned earlier, great to see Sam in the ball game number one and playing so well. And St. Joe tosses the ball away. Right when they'd like to make a move, they throw it away, but exactly nine minutes left in the second half. IPFW 76, St. Joe College 59. Mike Pittman deliberately bringing the ball up against Todd Grace. Andy Liebert out at the top of the key for IPFW. John Heidenstrider battling for some position underneath. Working very hard inside for that position. Mike Pittman with the drive. Back out to Andy Liebert. Andy with the drive inside again. Oh, John went up and had the ball, was going to try to squeeze it, and somehow it slipped out of there. Scheidler's a good looking ball player, uh, Charlie, for St. Joe. Yes, great athletic ability, and again, he plays out top a lot. And as you can see, he's very, he's strong enough to play inside and a good enough skills to play outside also. He's from not very far away here, uh, from down in Decatur, Indiana. Mike Pittman over to Sean Gibson. Back out to Sam Long. Again, John Hunstrider battling for a position on the inside. Back outside to Mike Pittman. Mike comes up just a little bit short. Sean Gibson rebounds. Back up to set up again. Another three-point try by Mike. He says, uh, give me a second chance and I'll do it. Back to that 18-point lead for the Mastodons. As we have a timeout by the St. Joe Pumas. Seven minutes and 40 seconds remaining in the season in this ball game for these two Great Lakes Valley Conference basketball teams. We have an interview at this time we'd like to share with you again from Coach Andy Piazza as he assesses the St. Joe team that is playing here tonight. St. Joe is one of those teams that's very difficult to play. Uh, they've had only average success the last few years. They've been 500 or a little bit above or a little bit below. Yet last year, the last two games of the year, they beat Southern Indiana and Kentucky Wesleyan, both national rank, both went to the tournament. Obviously, Wesleyan won the whole thing last year, and St. Joe beat them last two games. So their kids still play hard. They're very patient. And uh, I think the one thing that they have going for them uh, Saturday, it's going to be Bill Hogan's last game coaching there. He's the head basketball coach and athletic director, and he was just named this past week as the athletic director at the University of San Francisco, the big-time Division I program on the West Coast there. So it's going to be maybe a, an emotional time for the kids, and I think, obviously, that uh, he means a lot to that program and to the, the players that have played for him. He was recruited all these years. So I'm sure they'll have added incentive to send him out a winner even though it's going to be at our place. So I anticipate even more problems with St. Joe than usual. As you see with play resuming with an impressive play, the alley-oop slam dunk as Mark Scheidler put the ball down through the hoop. He went upstairs and got that one, Dave. He certainly did. Well, we just remarked that he's a good athlete, good ball player from not very far away here. Probably has some uh, hometown fans watching him here tonight. As Mike Pittman again hits a three. Might take this opportunity, Charlie, to pass along our congratulations to two of the lady Mastodons from the women's basketball program who just this week were named to the all Great Lakes Valley Conference team. Lisa Miller made the first team and Robin Scott the second team. So congratulations to those two young ladies. And also congratulations should go out to coach uh, Terry Rosensky. She's doing a great job with that uh, Lady Don basketball team since she's been here. Just done a spectacular job along with Coach Piazza turning both of these programs around doing a great job. The Lady Mastodons finished 19 and 9 uh, this year and were probably just a game or two away from perhaps their second straight uh, appearance back in the NCAA, but they have another opportunity next go around. But congratulations. Shiler's got a lot of confidence. He didn't play. He wasn't looking for the shots in the first half, but I guess it's easy to look for shots when you're getting spectacular dunks like he's been getting uh, in the second half. And he's found the confidence and he's looking for the ball right now. And he seems to get into the flow of things a little bit more uh, when Mike uh, Koski is not in there. Mike plays that inside a lot. Clarence Rich with the three-pointer. 
Sean Gibson might have had a chance at the rebound, but went up a little early that time. Rodney Gates with the ball. The inside, down the middle. Kevin McGuff gets his field goal. And all of a sudden that lead goes back down to 82 to 57. A little less than six and a half minutes to play here in the second half as the IPFW Mastodons seek to close out their season with a Great Lakes Valley Conference win. Victory number 16 they hope as we have an errant pass and now Clarence Rich has to try to stop three St. Joe players and by golly he did it. <laughs> and he came up with the ball and then throws it away. Clarence in the bottom of the rim made the defensive <laughs> play. He got a little help, didn't he? He did throw it away, but at least he got it back out of the territory where he was going to have some help on the defense next time around. Clarence struggling a little bit tonight. St. Joe with the ball, trailing by 15 points and six minutes to play. Good defense that time by Sean Gibson on that corner trap that Charlie's been describing for us a lot tonight. Shot goes up, no good. Tip back out, and St. Joe controls the ball for a new shot clock. A fresh 45 seconds. Lob inside, Mark Liebert. Not Mark Liebert, Mark Scheidler, I'm sorry. And we have an IPFW timeout. Been some many streaks in this game, exactly. Charlie, and uh, this latest one has belonged to St. Joe. And this basketball game is not over by any uh, stretch of the imagination, uh, Dave. These uh, Pumas are getting some, some, um, they're getting some confidence and uh, getting back into this basketball game is in a don. This is a good time out for them to get back into the flow of things and uh, get the lead back up. They sure have. Well, we invite the audience, uh, Charlie, to tune in to Channel 6 this Sunday evening at 7 p.m. to watch the tape replay from February 20th men's volleyball match with Ball State. The Cardinals challenge IPFW's Mastodons in Midwest Intercollegiate Volleyball Association conference action. And at 9 p.m. Channel 6 presents the tape replay of the Kentucky Wesleyan at Owensboro. That's right. Right here on Channel 6 this Sunday evening. Forget the graphic, go by what we just told you. Kentucky Wesleyan versus the Don. IPFW quickly down the floor. Andy Liebert goes to the uh, hole again. He misses it. Comes up short. St. Joe quickly down the floor. Quickly down and looking for a three. And we see Todd Grace with three, and we have that lead down to 10 points with just over 15 minutes to play. IPFW needs a score. Great hustle underneath there by Todd Grace. Young man's played a terrific second half uh, here, and not a bad first half. Yes, he has Joe. a great floor game, not just his scoring. Uh, he's played a good floor game, getting the other players involved in this basketball game, running the court. Dwayne Shears with three out of the corner, and it was down and in and then back out. Should have been worth two as far down as it went. But we see a foul called on Sean Gibson. Again, we saw Dwayne Shears with his feet set. Again, you said we should have given him at least two points for going so far into the basket, as you stated, Dave. Uh, great shooter when he gets his feet set, though, and that time it just went in and out on him. Interesting point of the game, Charlie, because IPFW just committed his 10th foul, which means every time they foul, St. Joe is going to have two free throws, regardless of the situation of the foul. And here they, they could, with five minutes and one second to go, cut this lead down to eight points. That's again if one of Mark those new rules coming into play there, Dave. Mark Scheidler eyes the free throw and hits it. So he'll have number two coming right up. And he hits it. He shoots a pretty flat free throw, but he got them both to uh, go dead center. So it's 82 74. And interestingly enough, foul called on St. Joe, but that's only their fifth foul of the half, and only, I think, maybe had four in the first half. Mm -hmm. 
So IPFW is not going to be likely to shoot a lot of free throws. And so we're going to have, oh, okay, kicked ball, reset the shot clock. IPFW is going to take a third shot now at getting the ball inbounds and bringing it down court. This press by uh, St. Joe giving the Dons a little trouble at the moment. That way, that time they got Doug Reinke to come down. Now Dwayne Shears pushed it in that time. Maybe that's what Coach Piazza wants him to do. On the other hand, he could have held it up and you know, started working on the clock. Since he didn't work on the clock, I'd say it's a pretty good uh, bet that he'd better hit a free throw or two yeah. here. <laughs> There's a situation, if you don't have the open layup, I think you do pull it back out, Dave. Yeah, it's not that you're trying to hold the ball back or stall, but right there you just didn't have a clear shot uh, to the basket. And he misses the first free throw. So number two coming up. And Dwayne hits the second. Nine point lead four minutes and 48 seconds left to play and IPFW puts on the full court pressure defense. <laughs> but St. Joe has absolutely no trouble with that press and gets the two point layup. And here we have the foul call and this I think will now put St. Joe into the bonus situation. Dwayne Shears will go back to the line, this time with an opportunity to shoot the bonus one and one. Seven point IPFW lead. Dwayne only a 66% shooter from the free throw line, but he hasn't had uh, many opportunities in his defense. But he drops the first one and will get this opportunity for the second. And he hits two. A couple of big points for the Mastodons. Push the lead back to nine. IPFW now exerting full court pressure. St. Joe handling the ball and coming across. Todd Grace. Gets the two. Wasn't and quite the way the Pumas designed it, but uh, they'll take the two points. That's right, it was, a, it was effective. Dwayne Shear with a great, great rebound, fake, and then put the ball back up. So the IPFW Mastodon's able to keep that lead at nine, just under four minutes to play. And this time, as Todd Grace made his move toward the basket, Dwayne Shears couldn't quite keep up. Got a half step behind and called for the foul. We'll see the replay coming up here as Dwayne Shears had just fouled out. Foul number five. Probably one of Dwayne's better uh, performances of the year. Charlie. I would definitely say his second best performance. His first and best <laughs> foremost performance was about a couple of weeks ago against uh, Bellerman. Well, I, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, but again, a great performance tonight uh, by Dwayne. And what we saw from Dwayne, along with Andy Lieber tonight, the fact that they were going to the uh, they were going to the basket strongly and looking aggressive and looking for the uh, offensive parts of their basketball game. Todd Gray steps up and hits that first. Dwayne had 18 points this evening. Had a good night. Good night. Back to a seven-point lead, 87-80. Three minutes, 57 seconds to play. No call as Sean Gibson got absolutely decked in the backcourt. Clarence Rich got in where it's awfully tight. We have a tied ball. The alternate possession will go to the St. Joe Pumas. St. Joe very aggressive at the moment, Charlie, just going after everything, every loose ball. IPFW dropping back now into their half-court defense. And you have to give these Pumas all the credit in the world, Dave. We stated uh, at what point in the basketball game what they had to do to get back in the game, and they've done just exactly what they had to do. 
And thusly, they're pretty much right back in this game. St. Joe on the move. Using a lot of the shot clock this time, which is a little surprising, but we see see that move and that drive to the basket. And Todd Grace has been doing that all second half. He draws the foul from John Honstrider, and he goes to the line. And again, he's uh, been the catalyst this second half uh, for the Pumas, Dave. He's come in, ignited the team, got the ball to the guys he's had to get the ball to, and when those guys are covered, he's went to the basket and scored, and to the free throw line and scored the points when he's had to. And for one of his few misses at the line, I think, he just had that free throw rim around and drop out. Well, as we saw the replay on that foul, John Hanstrader did not get cheated on that one. So we have a six-point lead for the IPFW Mastodons, and they're struggling here to handle that press. Pittman. Sean Gibson with the ball. Back out to Mike Pittman. Senior Mike Pittman playing his last three minutes of action here as an IPFW Mastodon. And Tony Martin fouled by Kevin McGuff. Tony will have an opportunity to step to the line for the one and one. And Mike Pittman's going up saying, Mike, come on, buddy, you can do it. Give us a couple right here. And Tony's uh, not shot out of that well this year on the free throw line. And one of his better games uh, a couple of weeks ago against uh, Ashland, he didn't shoot that well from the free throw line at all. As we see him knock down the first uh, free throw, which is very encouraging. Tony, only a 44% shooter on the year. Again, in his defense also, he's not shot that many on the year. Well, two, two right here would help his percentage a whole lot, as well as to help the IPFW Mastodons. And we have an 89-81 lead for the Mastodons here now with uh, just a little over two minutes and 30 seconds to play. And there we go, Todd Grace having a tremendous, tremendous game. I'm not sure whether Todd is uh, a senior or not. If, if he is a senior, he's going out in great style. Yes. Mike Pittman with the ball. Two minutes and 10 seconds on the clock. A six point lead for the IPFW Mastodons. And we have a foul called this time against Damon White. Clarence Rich will go to the line to shoot the one and one. One more foul on the uh, Pumas and we'll be shooting two each time up there. Yeah, sometimes uh, just a couple of uh, minutes ago, the fouls were 10 to four <laughs> in yep. favor uh, of St. Joe. And some those fouls just have a way of evening out before the half or the game ends. I didn't think we'd ever get to the point of shooting two, but uh, it's coming up. And there we saw a little exchange underneath as we're inside the two minute mark now with a minute 53. Well, with, this, with this situation, Dave, excuse me, you, you have to figure the uh, Pumas are gonna catch up in fouls because they're behind. That's right, and they had to uh, try to get that ball and put uh, IPFW at the line because IPFW is not a great free throw shooting team. And there we have uh, a foul called on uh, the Mastodons against Mark Scheidler before he took the shot. So he'll be shooting two at the line. Mark Scheidler at the line, shooting the first of two. And he drops it in, and it's a five-point game. He's working on a good basketball game himself, Dave. Uh, working on his 17th point if he can knock this free throw down. Most of which have come in the second half, I think. A great uh, second half for him. And IPFW is going to have to come down now and get that ball set and get it moving. And they're also going to have to defensively get a stop in here before this game is over. 
Mike Pittman wisely pulls the ball back, takes a look, didn't have a wide open move to the basket, so he's looking to see if there isn't. Uh, Clarence Rich in the corner with a three. Oh my. No rebound, and here comes St. Joe with an opportunity to cut into that four point lead. Clarence was wide open, but that still may have been an ill advised shot at this juncture in the basketball game, Dave. So now it's time to play some defense and to keep uh, St. Joe out there because we're nearing the one minute mark. And there's hey, a great, great steal. You talk about defense, couldn't have come at a better time. Tony Martin slams the ball down, and now that six point lead. Great steal and finish by Tony Martin. And a flying rebound by Mark Scheidler. I mean, flying rebound. Puts the ball back in, and we have a four point ball game. 91 87, 48 seconds to go. Charlie, these two teams get together. They never, ever play an easy one. Again, yeah, end. it looked like just. Just about halfway through the basketball game day, we thought this was going to be a blowout by the Mastodons, and here we are again at a barn burner. And here we have tonight uh, senior Mike Pittman playing his last game, and he had an interview that we'd like to share with you at this time. Uh, yeah, I definitely do. I've, I've got uh, a business started right now, which in the past month or so, uh, Coach was getting on to me at the beginning of the year because he said I was, I was uh, I'll use different terminology, but I was wasting away a good opportunity with my final year of basketball because I was so focused on my business and sort of trying to make a little bit of money on the side. But uh, I sort of put that in the back seat for a while, and uh, I haven't worked on that for the last couple of months at all. Uh, so I'm, I'm anxious once basket my basketball career is over as far as far as college goes to get back involved with that. And then uh, once I get done with my classes probably next year sometime, then uh, something will go from there, and hopefully I'll get a, a job in a Southern California, uh, Arizona area, someplace like that, where I can enjoy the weather all year round instead of being bundled up through half the months like you need to be in the Midwest. Back into the action, and on that first play, we saw a tip pass go out of bounds. First of all, uh, an indication that it might be St. Joe ball, but then the referee realized he just pointed the wrong direction. He knew he wanted the White to have the ball. <laughs> He knew that White should have the ball. Mike Pittman with the ball coming down now and 40 seconds to go in this ball game. Doug Ranke, Sean Gibson, Clarence. And we'll see uh, on the call here where, what they want to make, but it was Todd Grace, number four for St. Joe calling the play. And we'll see Clarence Rich stepping to the line this time to shoot two since we're now over the limit and into the 10th foul rule for St. Joe College. And we hope Clarence stays in there as we just saw the replay. Hope he stays in there and shoots those free throws. And there's the first one. Big free throw. Bend those legs and follow through, Clarence. Number two on its way. He hits them both. Six points, 32 seconds. IPFW in the lead. St. Joe beginning to get down to the, to the desperation time. And a great defensive move by Clarence that time, knocking the ball loose. Again, those quick hands by Clarence Rich. Get in hand on that basketball. Shot clock will not be a factor. And there was a three-point attempt, and Clarence Rich comes up with the rebound, and Clarence draws another foul. So he'll have another opportunity to go to the free throw line. And interestingly enough, Mark Scheidler just drew his first foul for a pretty active basketball player. He hasn't uh, had foul difficulties tonight. Very active and aggressive. And I don't know whether uh, Coach Hogan is conceding or not, but uh, he's making a sub couple of substitutions here to probably get some seniors their last action. I say probably because we can't tell from the program that was given to us here tonight what the class standing is for these St. Joe Pumas. Clarence hits one out of two, but uh, at this stage of the game, they'll take every one they can get because with 18 seconds to go and a seven point lead, Sean Gibson made that play as difficult as he could, but uh, didn't foul, which was good, which was good. Five point lead, 11 seconds. St. Joe calls the timeout, but it's strictly to, to stop the clock. Yeah, no strategy. no strategy. They know what they want to do. 
or no, they have to do, as a matter of fact. And they'll have to foul one more time, but I don't believe there's enough time for them to come up with a miracle finish. Clarence Rich is going to be the man well. at the line. <laughs> Clarence hasn't played all that well tonight, but he's kind of getting his average up with all these free throws he hit in the last uh, minute or so. And although he hasn't hit them all, he's hit enough of them to uh, keep this thing from getting out of hand. Clarence hits the first one. And I think uh, with that free throw, I think, Dave, we can safely name our Dandy Don player of the game at this moment. And uh, my vote goes to the lone senior on this Mastodon basketball team, uh, Mike Pittman. And I'd have to agree with you 100%. As we see there uh, on that missed free throw, Clarence Ritz kept it alive. Tony Martin put it in. And we have a final score of IPFW 97. St. Joe College 89 as the Mastodons finish their season fifth place finisher top of, in the top division of the GLVC and St. Joe College I believe finishes at eighth. Well it was an exciting ball game uh, Charlie probably more so than IPFW wanted it to be in the last three or four minutes. Exactly we had a 20 point lead Dave I thought it was going to be you know a blowout but um, you have to give up these uh, St. Joe Pumas a lot of credit. They got back into this basketball game and made it a very interesting towards the end. And as we uh, will go down and talk with Mike Pittman, our uh, player of the game, our dandy down player of the game, Mike Pittman. I was going to take a job with an engineering firm in New York. I got a better offer. I'm building schools overseas with the Peace Corps. The pace is a little slower than New York, but here I'm getting grassroots experience I couldn't get anywhere else. The way I look at it, the world can wait two years for another 40-story smoked glass high-rise. Peace Corps, the toughest job you'll ever love. Randy Travis on strings. Branford Marsalis. On the horn. Paul Schaefer on keys. Carly Simon on lead. There are a lot of different parts to play in the American Red Cross. Play your part. Every year, thousands of people are killed with a frying pan. Reduce your intake of high-fat fried foods and help reduce your risk of cancer and heart disease. For a free booklet on low-fat eating, call 1-800-EAT-LEAN. From the McGruff Files, the Philadelphia story. In certain parts of Philadelphia, things were uh, rough. Areas were run down, crime and drugs were out of hand, and honest folks felt like prisoners in their own homes. People decided to work with police to turn things around. Weekly meetings led to cleanup projects and folks working together. Soon, the neighbors had their neighborhood back. That's what happens when people and police work together. Write this down, and I'll show you how you can help uh, take a bite out of crime. No, I don't I guess they knew. Well, welcome back to the IPFW Athletic Center, where we are celebrating the finish of the season with a great victory by IPFW tonight. And at this time, we would like to have you join us with Charlie Washington as he interviews our Dandy Don player of the game, senior Mike Pittman. Charles Washington right here along with our Dandy Don player of the game Mike Pittman Mike in his last basketball game as a master Don a wonderful two years here with the Dons and Mike uh, tell us about this basketball game tonight first of all and then reflect back on your two years here uh, with the Dons uh, well the start the start of tonight's game we walked in and uh, our locker room was all decorated up by one of our fans you know and uh, they just wanted to show their appreciation for uh, coming out here and watching us play and that sort of got us boosted up for the last game Although we knew that we were going to be uh, not participating in the tournament, you know, sometimes uh, people might think it's hard for us to get up and get up, get in here and get up for the game. But uh, that sort of helped to uh, inspire us to know that that uh, the fans do appreciate us enough to go out of their way to do something like that. So that sort of take, took care of the first half. 
as far as being motivated for the second half, we came out and I don't know exactly what uh, our team's intentions were other than letting them back in the ball game and, and maybe giving the fans something to enjoy <laughs> other than a boring game. So uh, maybe I'll use that as an excuse for giving, keeping the fans uh, enthused in the game and still coming out with a victory in the end. Now you've had two great years here uh, with the Dons. Very consistent basketball player. Uh, just tell us about some of your leadership capabilities and how far you've come along from your junior year all the way through uh, your senior year here. Uh, well, my junior year here, uh, Lawrence Jordan Biggs, he took care of the leadership role, you know, real well. There's, I can't even say enough for how he led the team and. I didn't really uh, understand it as much until I got into sort of that type of role this year. Coach was on my case a lot because I wasn't leading the team. I think in because I can say it now because my career is <laughs> over with here. But uh, I guess I just wasn't being a leader in the type of leadership role he wanted me to be in. You know, I believe that there's there's all different types of leaders. You don't have to be uh, in a rut of one one particular personality in order to be a leader. And uh, I guess he and I had a conflict throughout most of the beginning of the year and towards the end of the year, you know, I started having some good games and tried to lead the team in my, the way my own personality would do so. And I think he sort of understood that a little bit more and, make, and that helped uh, his and I relationship go a little bit smoother than it was at the beginning of the year. And I think it helped out uh, at least my play and hopefully I'd like to think it helped out the team's play too. Mm -hmm. Now a little bit a little bit past the uh, midway point of the season, you guys are uh, 10 and 10. And a lot of guys had, a lot of people had written you off and then you came back and beat two nationally ranked basketball teams and finished very strong uh, on this basketball season. Yeah, at the beginning of the year, you know, we started off with a couple of, of vic uh, defeats that we thought definitely we should have had against some lower division teams, you know, that we just didn't play well. They did play well, and that's that sort of thing happens whenever you don't play good basketball. Sure. So the season, you know, it sort of just roller coastered up there and down for a while. We got eight straight victories and we got on a roll and then we just hit a bad slump again. So whenever we were 10 and 10, it, it was like we either could waste the rest of the season or the way or we could just bear down and do something. And some things started happening for us and we started playing half of the second, or playing good basketball the second half of Wesleyan. And from then on, uh, we just seemed to take care of a little, some business. You know, we just, we believed in ourselves. I think we, we had an attitude problem maybe there whenever to get to the 10 and 10 position, uh, I think we might have lost a little bit of confidence in ourselves. And then once some things started going for us, we got our, uh, I don't know, we got our, uh, I'm lost for words on this one. Act together? Sort of, yeah, our act together. We got some confidence and, and things started to take care of themselves. You know, the, out of the last three games, we dropped a couple and I really don't have any reasons and or excuses for that other than just we weren't back, our heads weren't back in the game again. Maybe we got a little bit cocky and got, got our riches you know we got it right back where we needed it in order to straighten us up for this get last game but coming out of here with a win tonight you know that that makes the rest of the summer for the guys go well as I know last year with the defeat with Ashland our last game of the year it made the summer go a lot better uh, mentally for us working hard and that type of thing so hopefully this game will do the same thing for the team next year great well Mike congratulations first of all on a great basketball game a great basketball season a great two years and career at IPFW has been a joy watching you play and call games uh, talking about those great passes through the legs of people and <laughs> how you antagonize some of the opposing players it has been a joy to watch you and good luck in your future endeavors sir thank you very much I appreciate that I've really enjoyed the two years that I've spent here it's been a real good experience for me also and I'm, I'm real happy to be a part of this organization thank you our dandy down player of the game Mike Pittman playing his last game here for the Dons. Congratulations to Mike Pittman again on a fine, fine career. The next live sports event on Channel 6 will be telecast Friday evening, March 22nd. Join us for exciting men's volleyball action when the netters from the University of California at Santa Barbara, Ball State University, San Diego State University, Converge on Fort Wayne for the 1991 Spring Fling Tournament. That's Friday evening at 6 p.m. right here on Channel 6. Immediately following this evening's game, we will be joining the University Network programming on Channel 6. Alternative music videos are presented in this edition of Video Underground. For Charles Washington, the entire Channel 6 staff, this is Dave Skelton. Thanking you for being with us this evening, and we'll see you next year.